Welcome to the 9 to 5 Dropout Show, where you learn from leading experts how to quit your job and successfully start your own business. With your host, author, owner of Mind, Body and Spirit Entrepreneur and creator of the 9 to 5 Dropout Academy, Rachel Thompson. Welcome to the 9 to 5 Dropout Show, your weekly inspiration to quit that 9 to 5, get off the hamster wheel, and finally pursue your passion. And today, we are talking to a rocket scientist. Yes, you heard me right. A rocket scientist turned author. We're talking to Stephanie Osborne, who is the interstellar woman of mystery, who worked for the space program for 20 plus years and has since authored or co-authored over 40 books. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Now, the first question that I always ask every guest is their nine to five dropout story. And I feel like yours is going to be extra interesting. (laughs) Can you tell the listeners a little bit about just your background and your past and how you went from being in the space program to becoming an author? Well, I wanted to work on the space program ever since I was a little kid, um, and I'm I'm one of the few people that can honestly say that they actually fulfilled their childhood dream. So I did work in the space program. I, you know, from the time I was in elementary school, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I also, from the time I was in elementary school, I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing fiction. And I tended to write either mysteries or science fiction or stuff like that. And occasionally I would kind of combine them. And so I've never really not written, although for a while there, when I was in the in the heat of the space program, I really just didn't have time for a whole lot of extraneous endeavors. Um, but after a few years, I realized I, I kind of need a creative outlet. Um, I worked... Uh, I was payload flight control. I worked uh, out of Huntsville, Alabama, but we worked really closely with mission control at Houston. There's a payload control in Huntsville and the mission control at Houston. And so I worked uh, shuttle missions. Uh, So I wasn't necessarily strictly nine to five. If I was in between a mission, then yes, it was nine to five. But if I was on a mission, you know, it might be nine to five, nine at night to five in the morning or, you know, midnight until noon or, or whatever. It was it was whatever the job required was the shift that I wound up on. Um, and, you know, it's it's everybody says, oh, that's so cool. Well, it is. And I got to see a lot of really cool stuff, but it's really, really stressful, too, because stuff happens, stuff goes wrong. Uh, you're trying very hard to make sure nobody up, upstairs, as we put it, gets hurt. Um, that 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 all of the experiments function correctly, and it's, it it can be really really tiring. So you know, it, it's like you come off the mission when the mission ends, you go home and you sleep for like a day, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then you get up and you go back into the office and you start work on the next mission, and. It, it's it's one thing to go through all of that, and then it's another to actually see a disaster occur and to know somebody who was in it. And that's what happened to me, because when the, the Columbia disaster occurred, that's the one that broke up during reentry, mm-hmm. uh, I had a friend of mine on board. Uh, I had helped train Kalpana Chawla for her very first mission. And, uh, and, and, and nobody came home from that one and she was on board it. And, um, she and I had stayed in touch over the years since, uh, since her first mission. And that was just a really, really hard thing to have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, that, that was kind of the beginning of the end for me. And I had already gone back to writing at that point. And one of the reasons why it was that that disaster was so stressful was because they always advise newbie writers write what you know. So I did. 
I wrote about a shuttle disaster. Hmm. I used the one that blew up by a launch uh, as my research material. <clears throat> but I said, I'm going to make mine different. I'm going to make mine occur during the entry. And sure enough, <laughs> wow. uh, I, I more or less predicted what happened to Columbia. Wow. <clears throat> And that was that. That was the second big hard blow for me. And a couple of years later, I wound up getting out of the program altogether, and um, and finishing my my writing mentor had to talk me out of trashing that manuscript, but he convinced me this can be a good book. So he wanted me to polish it. So I took a leave of absence and um, polished the book, and then wound up just leaving entirely. And, um, and he helped me, um, shop it around and find a publisher. And so Burnout, the Mystery of STS, Special STS 281 was my very first novel. Um, and as, as you said, I'm up to about 40 ish titles that I've authored, co authored, or contributed to. So, and that was about 10 years ago. So I've been busy. <laughs> yes, yes, you have. What, was the what finalized your decision to quit the job and focus 100% on your writing? Well, my husband is a heart patient and um he wound up like just before the Columbia disaster. He he was actually still recovering from triple bypass surgery um when the disaster occurred. And I, with so much time spent at the hospital talking to cardiac staffers and cardiologists and stuff, I learned a lot. And I learned, you know, how to tell um, when something is likely cause for concern versus when it's likely not cause for concern. Mm -hmm. And what wound up happening for me was that the stress levels reached a point where I was starting to have chest pains. Now, the good thing was with the kind of knowledge that I had as a result of what he went through, I knew these were the kind of chest pains that you didn't really have to worry about. They were like muscle spasms and things like that from the tension. But I kind of got to thinking about it, and he and I sat down and talked, and we were like, you know what? If I don't do something, it's going to be wind up progressing to something that I do need to worry about. And so we we sat down and we looked at finances because, of course, at that point, I didn't have a book sold. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how long will it take? And do I need to go find something else to do? And and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and I, I just I took a, a giant leap of faith and I stepped out and I said, I'm going to see about uh, becoming a writer. Wow. And I did. So in the meantime, I did some other things, you know, I tutored and, and some stuff like that in, in STEM fields um, to, to bring in a little extra income here and there. And, and he ramped up some of his freelance work and, and things like that. And, and we've done all right. So, and I'm, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing again. So this is a, this is a good thing. Yes, absolutely. What was it like? Okay. You quit your job. You sat down with your husband, you made this decision, and you both had some some side jobs that you were doing to make sure that um, you could put food on the table. What was it like trying to sell that first book, knowing that you were starting a whole new life for yourself, a whole new career as a writer? Um, it, was, it was a little bit scary. It was a bit discouraging. My, my writing mentor... Um, Travis Taylor is a New York Times bestselling author. So he's, he, you know, he knows what he's doing. And he basically sort of kind of functioned as an agent, I guess you would say, um, in that he approached some of the, the uh, publishers that he knew. And the first one he approached, um, I don't know, it was just kind of weird because um, I got back this, this critique from the reader. And I sat there and I read through the critique and I turned to Travis and I said, did he even read the book that I wrote? Mm. And he just kind of shrugged. He says, don't worry about it. I got other ideas. <laughs> um, 
<clears throat> so yeah, that was that was kind of kind of disturbing. Um, and and I still don't really, you know, it's like no, I I seriously don't think the guy wrote the critique about the correct book. Um, <laughs> um, to to this day, but you know, it it it's kind of one of those grit your teeth. This comes with the territory and keep going. Mm-hmm. Now this. This was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, they didn't have, you know, you couldn't just log into Amazon and upload your novel and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, that didn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was traditional pub or vanity press, and and you have to pay for vanity press. Uh, there are a lot of vanity presses still operating that are masquerading as, we will help get you self-published. <clears throat> Uh-huh. And and you wind up paying through the nose for something that I go over to Amazon and Nook and and upload my stuff and pay nothing. So thank you, you know, for. Don't, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to get, cut you off. But I was going to say thank you for telling our listeners about that. Uh, well, you know, it's 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 a case of don't get suckered. Mm-hmm. So, you know. What was it like then, uh, searching for publishers and? Um, you said that your mentor did it, but how many did you have to go to before one picked up your book? What was that process like? Actually, um, <clears throat> I hit pay dirt on my on on the second attempt. Oh wow! He submitted the the uh, manuscript to them on I think it was a Friday, and by Sunday I had an email saying. This is what our standard contract looks like. Do you have any any problems with any of the terms within it? Mm-hmm. And I looked it over, and you know, not being familiar with such, I said, "Travis, what do you think?" He said, "It's standard. It's good. Go with it." Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so on Monday, I had an actual contract for my book in hand. That was so. Yeah, you know, sometimes sometimes lightning strikes and sometimes not so much. Mm-hmm. Uh later mm-hmm. on I had a, a, a book that I had, had written and um I wound up having a, a really hard time finding a good publisher, a good fit for it. And my my current publisher, the one that picked up Burnout, wound up uh picking it up eventually after about oh, I don't know, a year of shopping it around through an actual agent. And um, unfortunately, it w- it leaned more toward the mystery end of things rather than the science fiction end of things. And my my regular publisher was more known for the science fiction. So um, after so several years later, fast forward to today, I actually um, after much discussion with her, when I got an offer from another publisher, she and I had been talking about this anyway. Um, she reverted the rights to me, and I put it up with a different publisher who actually does have a mystery imprint that that is successful and 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 fairly popular. So uh, it 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 pays to to be perseverant. Yeah, definitely. And I think you've brought up a lot of things that our listeners might have some questions about such as shopping through publishers. You know, it, it, some people might think that you just, you stick with one publisher and all the books that you publish, you go through them. But it sounds like depending on the type of book that you put out, you try to find a publisher that would be best for that novel, correct? Well, yeah, that's, that's really what you want to do because if you've got a publisher that's known for, say, romance, you know, you don't want to put out um, a, a hard, you know, real life crime story, mm-hmm. truth, mm-hmm. <laughs> because they don't have connections to the people who want to read your your true crime story. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> there, there, there are advantages to finding the right publisher for a given genre. You know, if they, if that is the genre you're writing in, you want to try to find a publisher who publishes in that genre, not one that's off someplace in another completely unrelated genre. Um, for the simple reason that, as I said, 
you, by going with with a publisher in that genre, you know that the people that follow them are going to be readers of that genre. Mm-hmm. So you're going to want they're going to be able to access the people that want to read you, and so that is a distinct advantage there. Uh, so yes, I, since I do tend to split genres a little bit. You know, I I mix them. That's why I'm known as the interstellar woman of mystery. There's a whole joke there uh, Mm -hmm. behind how that that nom de guerre came about. But it's it's because I write science fiction mysteries and I cross genres. Um, And, you know, some books may be a little more mystery and some books may be a little more science fiction. So I I have to kind of play off which one is which uh, as to who I submit a given uh, a given book to, and then of course you know I, I started in somewhere along the way, the the whole self publishing thing came up, and so the first thing I did when I got into the the whole being a published author thing, bless her heart, um, I picked my publisher's brain <laughs> because uh, I'm just I'm naturally curious and I was trying to understand why do you do it this way versus that way? Mm-hmm. And, and so she was patient. She taught me, she taught me all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, if she knew the answer, uh, she told me she didn't, she didn't hold anything back. And so I learned and I looked at the stuff that she did and she has a reputation for turning out really good quality books. And I, I got, I got a taste for how that all worked. So then when I started, when the whole self-publishing thing started cropping up, the first thing I started to do was I started to put out stuff that didn't fit with any standard traditional publisher. Like maybe it was a novella or it wasn't big enough to be a book, you know, but it was too big to go in an anthology or, you know, that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. Um, And I learned. I learned. you know, how to format it and how to get it looking right. And, oh, that didn't work too good. Let me try this again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, that that kind of thing. And then um, a couple years ago, I launched in, into actually print books uh, through my own. I created my own imprint uh, called Chromosphere Press. And um, for obvious reasons, you know, background in science, so of course, you know, a, a space science, so of course, it had to be something spacey. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so then I decided to start trying print books, and that has been a challenge, but I'm I am very very pleased with the result. I've got an entire series that I'm putting out through Chromosphere Press now, and uh, that they look good. I mean, they, they, you cannot really tell, um, from a traditionally published book. So I have very high standards. I do use uh, editors. I do use a professional graphics artist for the covers, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, it, it, it's a good quality product and I'm very proud of it. Is this something you just do for yourself, or is this something that other authors can use your services for? Well, I do. um, I do freelance editing. Um, um, I was known even before. uh, One of the things I used to do, just as part of the job with with the space program, we put out documentation out the wazoo, and um, and we always, you know, people had to edit it. So I was one of the people that often wound up both writing and editing the documentation. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that kind of, I always had a good grasp. I, I did well in school and English and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it served me well over the years. And when I sit down to write, I automatically apply that same critical eye to what I'm writing. And so I was always known as somebody who turned in one of the cleanest manuscripts in, manuscripts in the business. And then my publisher started using me uh, as a freelance editor. And so then I started getting requests from other authors, um, n- a number of whom are self-published themselves. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I have, I have repeat business among those because they really like what I do. Um, and I try to teach as I go, as, as I learn things about the business, I try to pass it on. Um, so, you know, if I learn, oh, it, it flows better if you structure it like this, then I try to make sure that my, my clients, my editing clients are aware of it. Um, I'm starting to consider the possibility of opening it up to um, I would be willing to format for ebook, um, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, hmm. So, you know, yeah. So, yes, I, d- I don't run them through Chromosphere Press because right now Chromosphere Press is a DBA. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, doing business. I, I have set it up. For those who yes. don't know what a DBA it, it, is. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I haven't set it up as an LLC or anything like that yet. It, it's not a formal corporation. It's just me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so that's that's some place that I'm not quite ready to go yet, um, because that would that would mean oh now I've got to hire some more people, you know, accountants mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not really quite ready to go there. You but uh, yes. Um, I, I do freelance all that other stuff. So now I'm curious because I am a fellow self published author and I use Amazon's Create Space for my print books. So do you not go through the Create Space? You just print them your on your own then? I have I have one book. It's it's a children's book. I put it through Create Space. Um I have been less than impressed with the quality mm-hmm. uh that I have gotten from Create Space. Uh, other people, I've you know, I've got there are other traditional publishers that actually go through Create Space, and it, it, and it, as far as I can tell, it looks okay um, because I, a couple of them that I work with, some anthologies that I'm in, have gone through Create Space. It's it, it's I think it is a little more intuitively obvious than what I use, but because I spent so much time learning from my traditional publishers, I got along okay in it. I actually use Ingram Spark, mm-hmm. uh, and Ingram is is um, you know was a distributor. Mm-hmm. It was a book distributor before they did before they did this, and um, so by going through Ingram Spark, I ensure that I get a wide reach on the books. Anybody, any any store or any library or whatever that wants to can go through Ingram and get the book. Um, and also, like I said, I, I think, and this and this is just my personal opinion. Your your mileage may vary, but I like the product better. I like the end result of the of the, the printed book better. Um, in in the whole time that I've been doing this the last couple of years, um, I've I've had exactly one book that I had to return and get a get a a replacement copy because. Uh, the binding didn't take real well, and so some of the pages were coming out. Oh, okay. um, and in in for Create Space, I've actually virtually almost every time I've ordered copies of my children's book, I've had at least one copy come in with problems. Uh, usually, it's a case of it winds up having <laughs> having two sets of pages bound in one cover is it seems to be a common problem that i get um oh, wait can you explain that again um, two sets of pages and one cover yeah like like if you've got a stack of pages here's here's the book here's mm-hmm. the, here's the unbound pages for the book mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. here's here's a stack of pages you wind up with two sets of those bound in one cover oh okay i see what you're saying yeah, or, or one and a half, or so, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. But it, 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 it. Not only does it not look right, it do, you know, because the cover doesn't fit around all those extra pages. Mm-hmm. But then, but then you've, you know, you've got a book that you can't possibly sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So they have. The, that said, they have been very good. I turn around and I contact them and I say, "Hey, I got this," and they send me a replacement with no, you know. I don't even have to pay extra shipping. They'll just send me a replacement. So mm-hmm. there's that, but I've never had to do that with Ingram Spark. So 
Okay, good to anyway, know. That's that's just my yeah, my take on things. No, um, it's it's good I to know like because it, I think it's hard. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say a lot of the listeners uh, are interested in publishing their own book, and and we're kind of throwing out a lot of different names here of things that people might not be familiar with yet. Um, so I just wanted to clarify really quickly. Um, when you self-publish, you can do it on Amazon. You can also do it on other platforms, but obviously the most popular one is Amazon and you can do the ebook and then you could do the print version. And to do the print version, you go through Amazon's website called CreateSpace. And I did just want to note that I, when you do a book through CreateSpace, you upload it and you can do a digital proof where you just see what that book would look like online, or you can have the book sent to you and it's only a few dollars. I highly, highly recommend getting the book sent to you because it's similar to you, Stephanie. I have gotten books sent to me. And I'm like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> so I just yeah, wanted to yeah. throw that out there for people who are listening. And, and I agree with you. And, and I've done the same thing with Ingram Spark. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, so if, if uh, I always get a, um, an e-proof, but then I also often, not always, I'm starting to get the hang of the e-proof, but at least for the first several books, I also ordered uh, hard, hard, you know, hard copy proofs to look at. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, it's a couple extra books, um, but it, it's worth it to know that that oh geez okay yeah that looks or no that wasn't right at all or you know mm -hmm. whatever so yeah um i i like it i like it either way um uh, either either publisher mm -hmm. the, the important thing to note i know for sure with create space uh i don't i haven't ever tried it with with ingram spark you can buy an isbn which is an identification number, which is required for a, a print book through Create Space, or you can buy them through Boker. Uh, if you buy it through Create Space, Create Space will be listed as the publisher. Mm. So just just be aware of that. If you if you if you do like I've done and create your own imprint, then you have to be kind of careful about that. That you don't wind up with with the printer listed as the publisher. Yes, that is good to know. I did not realize that. That is yeah. very good to know. Now I have one more publishing question and then we'll move on to some other things. But since you have experience both with working and having your uh, book sold through a publisher and then going the self-publishing route, what is the difference and do you have a recommendation for one versus the other? Oh, the difference is there, there, there are two differences. Um, if you self-publish, you will be making, you will be getting more per copy sold than if you traditionally publish. However, you will also be doing all of the work. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and there's a lot to it. You know, I, I tell people my, I, when I'm self-publishing, particularly the job, this is only step one out of a dozen steps. When I write the end at the end of the manuscript, um, you know, then then the real work starts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you traditionally publish, you write the end at the end of the manuscript. Maybe you go over and you you reread it and polish it a little bit. You submit it to the to the publisher, the publisher sends it off to the editor. Depending on how the publisher works, you may or may not get the edits back for approval. Oh. Some publishers don't even do that. Some publishers just take it, make the edits, and run with it. I don't necessarily agree with that modus operandi. I, I think that it's the author's work. The author should have approval over any changes they're made. Yeah, I don't um, really like that. That's a little unsettling. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the majority of them I found actually do come back and say, "What this? these are the proposed edits. 
um, what do you what do you want to keep and what do you not want to to use? Mm-hmm. Which it actually has been good because I've actually had editors that injected more errors into my work than were already there. Oh wow! Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> there are some folks out there hanging up editorial shingles that don't need to be hanging up editorial shingles. Yes, uh, I have I have dealt with that as well. So uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> second that okay. Um, <laughs> Oh, so yeah, um, and and this this is just a thing of you know, it's it's like any other business. There are people out there who are there to help you, and there are people out there who are there to rip you off, and there are people out there who think that they're more uh, skilled than they really are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's it, just any other. It's like any other business. Mm-hmm. So it's just something that you got to watch for but you know at that point you're done when when you when you send back the edited manuscript and say these are the edits that i incorporated and these are the edits you know versus the ones that i don't want you're done Mm -hmm. uh everything else is up to the publisher the publisher will format it uh for ebook and print the publisher will lay out the print version the publisher will see to it that there is a a cover art made uh, and you usually do not get approval of the cover art Mm. Um, and the publisher will work out the the promotional blurbs and stuff everything you know from from that point on you're done as an author Mm -hmm. unless you're self-publishing in which case you have to do all of that yourself Mm -hmm. so it is it is not it is not easy. Yes, you get more of the royalties yourself if you self-publish, but you've also got all this other stuff to do. Mm-hmm. So, and and that's where that's there's there's among readers I found um, there's still a stigma if you're self-published because there's so much stuff out there where somebody has said I want to be a writer and has just written something and not gotten anybody to proofread it even or, or format it or anything. And they just come up with, um, you know, they, they, they think that they themselves are as talented an artist as they are a writer. And so they, it, they come up with a cover that looks like a child drew it. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes this happens. <laughs> Oh, and and then and then they throw it up there, and then they wonder why they're getting all these one star reviews, and people don't want to buy their books and stuff. It's like, no, that's because you didn't treat it like a job. Yeah. You, you you know, it's it's you have to go through all of these steps first, and you didn't. Mm-hmm. And also, um, it's not as big anymore, but. A few years ago, people did the self-publishing as a um, almost like a money-making scam, and they would hire really cheap writers f- that have been outsourced from overseas and um, would throw a book together, and they were pub- publishing like three, five books a week, and they didn't oh, yeah. care if they were good quality, and they're just throwing them out there and getting all this money, and it did. It, uh, it, that's, it, not, it that's not past tense. That's still occurring. It is. Yeah. It's... It's not as big of a money making um, venture as it used to be because Amazon did change some of. Um, well, but but they're still working on it because there's still a scam out there right now with the um, what is it? Is it Kindle Unlimited? It's the pay the, the page yep. is red. Uh huh. Um, because because there's still scammers out there. They're trying. They're in the process of trying to crack down on that right now. What they'll do is they'll take stuff like that and they'll bundle several books together Mm -hmm. or they'll bundle, you know, garbage stuff at the end of it. And, and they'll put that out there. It'll be like a thousand page book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they'll do stories. It's 30 pages. Yep. Yep. And they'll have like a link in the beginning of the book. When you click it, it goes to the end of the book. So it makes it like counts all those pages as being read. It's yeah. There's a lot. There's all this scammy stuff that's going on out there. And 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 since the that that the Kindle Unlimited is a shared pot mm-hmm. with the majority of the money going to the authors, quote unquote authors, 
with the most pages read, mm-hmm. then these these people who are doing these scammy things are getting the money, the lion's share of the money that should be one of the other authors. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff going on out there. But you're right. Amazon is trying very, very hard to crack down on all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a little complicated, but but they're they're working hard on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely. And it's a shame for real authors like yourself who put out quality material who treat this as their job. Now, knowing that, uh, you know, there might be a little bit of. Um, discrimination against self-published authors saying that they're not as good as published authors or the books aren't as good as published books. And um, knowing that there's a lot of scammers out there who know all of these crazy marketing tactics and are doing all of these unethical things that are taking away from the actual good books, like the ones that you write, what do you do to get your name out there? What do you do to really promote your work in a very crowded field it's hard Mm -hmm. and and to be honest i'm still learning the whole marketing and promotion aspect of the business um you know i rocket scientists don't have to do marketing and promotion (laughs) (laughs) my 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 graduate and undergraduate degrees are all in science Mm -hmm. scientists don't do marketing and promotion i'm learning all of this as i go Mm -hmm. um and i'm still struggling with it uh, but one of the things that I that I like to do, yeah, you know, one of the things that helps me with the stigma against the the poor, poorly written, poorly edited, self published books, is that's the reason why I did come up with my own imprint. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you don't, then what what they do is they stick the author's name in as a publisher just by default, mm-hmm. and so then everybody knows that it's self published. And so I have a logo, you know, Chromosphere Press is my imprint. Chromosphere Press is what goes on the title page, you know, the, the flyleaf. It's what goes on the back cover. Um, it's what goes on the copyright page, you know, blah de blah de blah um, And so that helps a little bit with, with, with that stigma because people, yeah, I'm not afraid to tell people this is me. Mm-hmm. Because by that point they've realized, oh well, you know this is good. This this is this is a well written book. This is a well crafted book, mm-hmm. and there's a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they look at it and they say, oh okay, she knows what she's doing. This is not your run of the mill self published book. If for no other reason than most self published authors don't bother even putting up a print book. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just throw throw it up as an ebook, and and I'll grant you that's where most of the of the income comes from is the ebooks these days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But another thing that I do um, to help promote myself, you know, aside from I do interviews and things like that, I also go to conventions. In you know, there there are mystery conventions, there are science fiction conventions, there are all this kind of stuff, and I go there. And I don't just sit in the dealer room and sell books. I go and I give talks, and I sit on panels and I discuss stuff. Um, I just I just had a science fiction convention this past weekend uh, in in another city, and I had an absolute blast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I appeared on a panel with a number of other uh, experts discussing. How do you build a moon base? What 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 things do you have to consider in order to create a moon base? And I gave a talk on uh, the, the Yellowstone supervolcano. And last year I gave a talk on the New Madrid um, fault, earthquake fault system in the middle of the country that nobody knows about unless you live there and you felt it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do this stuff and I, and I give these talks and I discuss stuff and I'm available to the readers, to the fans to come to me and discuss stuff and ask questions and talk about my latest book. 
and all this kind of stuff. I, I When I give a talk, not infrequently, I get asked, will you turn it into a blog article or a series of blogs? Uh, are you going to make it into an ebook? Oh, please do. You know, so this this is something that I've started doing. So I actually, some of my books these days are actually popular science books in addition to the science fiction and the mystery. Because of my background, you know, and because people know I know my stuff, I'm going to tell them straight. I'm going to explain it on their level. Uh, they know they they can go and get one of these popular science books and read it, and they're going to understand it, and they're going to come away having learned something, mm-hmm. something that they think is cool to know. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that I do to help promote. Um, are there other ways to do it? Most certainly, I'm working on those. Uh, but the, these are, I, I think that, I think that face to face with my fans is is one of the best ways because ultimately everything that you do is going to boil down to do you have a fan do you have a reader who thinks what you write is so cool that they're going to tell other people about it mm-hmm. and that's what it amounts to it's it's I don't care how hard you try to grow your fan base, organic is the way it's going to go. And so, you know, later on tonight, I'm going I'm going to start trying something else that somebody recommended to me. I'm going to go, I've got a fan club group on Facebook. I'm going to go into that group and I'm going to do a live video chat Ooh. with my fans. And this is, this is the first time I'm going to try that. Mm-hmm. But, you know... I'm going to see what happens. I love how you emphasize the face-to-face. And whenever I asked you that question, I certainly did not expect the answer that you gave. Because, you know, a lot of authors say email list, you know, I build an email list, I, um, you know, social media, all that kind of stuff. But what you're saying is face-to-face interaction with your fans, you're building that relationship. They know that you put out good books. They know that they like to read your books. And you're, you make yourself available to them, which I think in a digital world, we too often forget about or neglect. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and, you know, I've, I've tried all this. I've done the blog tours and, you know, the paid for the promotional, you know, uh, the, the, the book bubs and the book gorillas and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And, and, if you do, if if when usually when the things first start they work really well, but then as time goes by people figure out how to game the system, mm-hmm. and once they figure out how to game the system then it doesn't work as well. And so ultimately, what it boils down to is word of mouth. Yeah. You know the the best way to grow a a dedicated fan base is always going to be word of mouth. That's so so that's what I'm true. trying hard to do. That's what I'm trying really, really hard to do. And trying to figure out how to do that because I cannot be everywhere at once. Yeah. And I'm older than I used to be and I'm handicapped now and I don't get around as well as I used to. And so that that's hard. But I do my absolute dead level best. And that's one of the reasons why when somebody suggested I do these live chats on social media, I thought, hey, that's kind of a cool idea because, okay, fine, maybe I can't make it out to California anytime soon to talk to the fans that are out there, but I can get online and talk to them. Yeah. That's you know, cool. so that's, you know, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Yeah. And you're utilizing the online space to get in front of your fans. You're not hiding behind it. Like I think some people oh, no. like to do. Yeah. And, 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 and that's not necessarily the the good the good way to do it because mm-hmm. they can tell. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well, I know that we have been chatting for a while and we have not touched yet on your most recent book. So I uh, want to let the listeners know 
that she was kind enough, Stephanie was kind enough to give us an excerpt from that book. And I'm going to post it on Mind, Body, and Spirit Entrepreneur. I'll link to that in the show notes. But can you give us just a little sneak peek of what your most recent book is about? Well, my most recent book is called Definition and Alignment, and it is book seven in that in that series that I was talking about that I've been putting through Chromosphere Press. Um, that series is called the Division One series, and it's my take on the urban legend of the guys in the dark suits that show up at the UFO encounters and the alien abductions and make the evidence go away. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I play it... Um, there's there's um, a lot of, of fun there. I write it very tongue in cheek. Um, there's a lot of serious action adventure there. There's a smidge bit of romance because the two main characters, the two agents that are paired up, uh, are male and female, and so it turns out that there's an attraction there. Mm-hmm. So as as time progresses, they become closer they become very trusting of each other they become best friends and now basically what we have is an old enemy has come back uh to haunt them and so that relationship is is threatened because uh echo and omega uh are the two agents and the old enemy wants echo dead and intends to use omega however is necessary in order to ensure that Echo dies. And if she dies in the end, that's okay by him too. Mm. Yeah. It sounds really good. And like I said, from the excerpt that you gave me, it definitely is. So I, I encourage everybody to check that out and I'll link to that below. Can you let the readers know where they can find out more about you and more about your work? Absolutely. Uh, you can go to my website, which is stephanie-osborne.com, uh, or you can go to my um, you can go to my fan page on Facebook. You can go to uh, my Amazon author page, uh, but probably the best place is, is my website, stephanie-osborne.com. And I will link to that as well in the show notes so that you can have easy access to it. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I really enjoyed this conversation and you shared tons of valuable tips for people who want to get into the writing and the self-publishing or going through a publisher, but just becoming an author. You've shared so many great tips with our audience. So thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me. All right. So like I said, all the links will be below as well as the link to the nine to five dropout Academy and the free 10 steps to starting your business PDF and mini course. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and I will talk with you again next week. Thank you for tuning in to the nine to five dropout show. Be sure to check out the links below to enroll in the 9 to 5 Dropout Academy and receive your free gift and mini course. Let us know what you thought of this week's episode by rating or leaving a review.